Welcome back. Segment two, Locked On Senators, Locked On Canucks here discussing the roster construction. If you've missed segment one, if you're watching this on Locked On Senators, go check it out. Locked On Canucks. Make sure you smash the subscribe button there as well. Now, Trevor led into this segment talking about questionable decisions by Pierre Dorian. We know none more questionable than coming on Locked On Senators, not once, not twice, but three times. We expect him back as well. But man, there is no GM more active than Pierre Dorian. He's had some swing and a miss right in the dirt, and he's had some absolute home runs. Sometimes the home runs are with his eyes closed because Martin Jones decides to have an 896 save percentage, and San Jose drops third overall Tim Stutzel in the Eric Carlson trade. That worked out just fine. But before we get to Pierre Dorian, I want to discuss the Vancouver Canucks, who have gone through a transitional phase with their management, with their coaching over the last few years. Like, where, how far back do you guys want to go? Like, I know you want to forget the Jim Benning era, but like, how long do you think it's realistically taken for Jim Rutherford and company, Patrick Alvin, to put their own stamp on this roster? I would yeah, say, I mean, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, I would say like pretty much the middle of last year, it kind of like started coming together. Now, with that being said, I know they signed McKayev back in July, a couple summers ago, but again, it just kind of felt as if the middle of last year, they kind of put it, put these pieces together. And if you look at how many changes they've actually made to the actual construction of the team too, now a lot of those players are on short, short term deals. I think it's just exciting to see how they've gotten rid of a lot of the players who are kind of holding this team back and not making things easier for those top end guys. And that's why I, alongside a lot of people are just curious and excited to see how this team transitions from being, you know, a bottom team when it comes to defensive hockey to maybe like to the 20th or like the 18th or the 16th or top 16 in the league and how much that can do for somebody like Thatcher Demko, who again is the biggest X factor on this team is probably one of the most important players to any team individually across the league. And yeah, just, I know there's a lot more work to do work to do. I know Rutherford did allude to the fact how there's still one or two contracts that he still wants to get rid of but it really did start in the middle of last year. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, you know, this management regime has now been in place for a little over 18 months. Right. And I think there's probably two, maybe three problem contracts left, right? You got Tyler Myers uh, and a one year deal. You guys don't want Tyler Myers, by the way, you guys took Hamannick. You guys seem <laughs> like our defenseman. You guys, man, the Sens were before. rumored uh, with Tyler Myers for longer <laughs> than I was comfortable with. I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> Uh, solid top four pairing defenseman if you're uh, trying to draft first overall. Um, so, you know, he, Tyler Myers, Tucker Pullman on LTIR are probably not going to play again. And then you probably have one too many expensive winger contracts. Connor Garland's the one that they inherited. Um, so, I mean, I, I think there's they're pretty close to cleaning up this mess. I think you do want to get rid of Myers and probably another winger contract and continue to bolster the defense. Uh, probably ideally you want maybe a more polished, better third line center than like a P.U. Suter or a Teddy Bluger. Uh, but the Stamps are on this team, and I think Jordan Rutherford said it, for better or for worse, that if everything goes right, the Canucks are going to make the playoffs. And some people love that quote, including Kyle. I just I also feel like 32 other general managers would say that, and I feel like Perry Dorian might have said that, maybe on your guys' show. Hey, he's been saying that for years, and now he's, <laughs> now he's been, you know, twice bitten at this point. I was going to say once bitten, twice shy, but he's been bitten more than once here. I think the, the most notable one is this one here. We're a team. We're a team. When he was asked what he was excited about uh, in terms of his 2019, <laughs> obviously that didn't work out. And then he said the rebuild's over. But now, I mean, the rebuild is over at this point. You go out and you you add players. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're Alex to bring it and they want to go home. So I think that in that position, mm -hmm. he did the best he could. But with the Vancouver Canucks, I want to continue on kind of like the roster construction there. And it looks like in day one training camp, lots can change. But Hogland. If I'm pronouncing that right, like, like, is he an X factor here too, or is he easily replaceable? As because he's getting reps with Kuzmenko and Pedersen right now, day one training camp. Oh, so yeah, I don't know. I don't think he's an X factor. I think, like, again, the East they're not staying up to watch Canuck games, and, and I, I can get why people may look at that and be like, really, Hoaglander, a guy who's in the AHL, he's going to be your top liner, and these are the guys who think they're going to win a cup before the the Ottawa Senators. Really, like, I don't see that happening. I think. Uh, Tockett just wants to see everything. He has noted that he wants guys like Pot Colton and Hoaglander to play a bit more reckless, and maybe they can be more themselves if they have a confident start in training camp slash play with the best players. I'm not really 
digging too deep into that. Now, okay. also, Mikheyev didn't show up uh, in day one, not because of injury, but because of personal reasons. I wonder if that would have uh, shuffled things initially right. in training camp. Tell, tell our listeners then who aren't staying up that late, like this Kuzmenko kid, because Sens fans oh. wanted him too, and they were rumored to be in the mix when uh, when that was all going down. He's the real deal, eh? Yeah, and you know what? It probably just came down to Vancouver being a nicer city than Ottawa. No offense, <laughs> my wife's from Ottawa, but uh, Vancouver is pretty sweet, man. It's pretty. It is sweet. pretty nice. I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I think again, I you know, I heard there was you know twenty five teams after Kuzmenko. I'm sure there was probably thirty two teams after him, right? But you know, I, I think it came down to him really liking the city, the shop beside Elias Pettersson, who, as we've discussed on the show, is the best player on either of our teams. Um, and then also, you know, pa- Patrick Alvin had been scouting him for years. So there's kind of a relationship there as well. Um, I do want to see it again from Kuzmenko. I mean, you know, 39 goals as a rookie who was reportedly a bit out of shape, according to a lot of reports. Um, so he's got the pure skill, but maybe uh, there's another gear there if he can get in better shape. But he also had a 27 percent shooting percentage last season, uh, which is almost which is fairly unsustainable. Uh, but as Kyle's mentioned on our show, the everydayers, they know this. He didn't shoot the puck a lot last year. So there's a world where his shooting percentage goes down, but he still ends up scoring more goals um, just because he's going to shoot the puck more, potentially. Now, one thing I will say is uh, if Kuzmenko went to Ottawa instead of Vancouver, he wouldn't have to worry about getting hassled at the pumpkin patch, though. <laughs> or was that? No, it was JT Miller. Yeah, but <laughs> how, how is JT Miller doing many pumpkin patch excursions or he, he stays away from those now? Those are hostile environments. <laughs> well he did say uh there was a post on canucks twitter today about you know what what uh, the canucks want to be when they grow up and jt miller said he wanted to be a stay-at-home dad and i think the key word was stay at home so, <laughs> <your point. laughs> that's hilarious no J- jt miller is a uh, one of those like big x factors for the vancouver canucks too yeah. and i think the league kind of knows who he is and what he can do uh, again one of the like i guarantee this guy's on like the top 20 top 25 as far as point goers go in the last four years He's put up a lot of points, um, but there's a lot of hope coming from this side, this studio. Again, Kyle Bowen just thinking that JT Miller can get back to being a 90 point guy, at least in the first couple of years of this new extension. And that's why, again, I'm optimistic. Like if everything goes right, Rutherford, man, we're putting that on a shirt. If everything goes right, if Pedersen is, you know, playing at an MVP form, like he's kind of did last year, but the team didn't make the playoffs. If Hughes is a Norris nominee, if Demko is a Vezna nominee, a lot of things going on here, but then if, Miller also is the best second line center in hockey. That's just like a different recipe. It's obscure. Maybe they're not as deep as other teams, but the top end talent on this team, if they do reach their potential, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's again, going from zero to a hundred isn't nearly impossible in the world of sports. But again, maybe it's because of that 420 magic that we're kind of thinking that it is possible over here. I, I want to ask you guys a question. Like how come, like how come you guys have been so patient with Dorian? And was there any point over the last like three years where you guys were overly frustrated? Because on this side, when betting kept getting extended and kept getting chances, like, dude, it, t- it turned a lot of people off. It frustrated people like to another level. Did it ever get to that point with Dorian? And I think a lot, there, there's definitely, there's always a portion of every fan base that just wants to fire everybody all the time. And only one team gets to be happy at the end of the season. But I think in Ottawa, and, and I'm going to let Pilsy kind of elaborate on this. I think it's more everyone's kind of pointing at the coach versus the, uh, the general manager, at least right now. Yeah. Well, the thing with Ottawa is when you have a, an owner that isn't exactly uh, popular, Popular, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, there was billboards all over Ottawa, hashtag Melnick out. People spent good money advertising to try to get the owner out of town. It makes things difficult. Uh, guys don't really want to stay around. It's a trickle-down effect, right? So, And look, people can say what they want about Pierre Dorian, but if your owner is telling you, hey, you can't do this, I won't let you do this, you can't spend this, the guy's hands are tied, right? There's only so mm-hmm. much you can do, unfortunately. Whereas now, it's a new era, Michael Anlauer comes in as the new owner. The Sens are spending to the cap. They've got guys willing to commit right off their entry-level deals. they got free agents coming in and signing long-term contracts when they have interest elsewhere. And it's just, it's a whole different vibe Mm -hmm. now. And I think fans are willing to kind of, or at least I'll speak for myself, willing to let go of the six years of pain and rebuilding and frustration because now the path is clear. Like before the path wasn't clear. That was the issue. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, are we just going to rebuild forever? And then as soon as these guys are UFAs, they're going to leave. Like, what's the point of that? Like all, all Sens fans, favorite players were getting shipped out of town. And that makes it tough to stick around as a mm-hmm. fan. And I think now we're at a point where 
The owner is set. It's trickling down. He's adding different departments, like Ross said. Finally, the Sens have an analytical department. More people are coming back into the system. Sens alumni want to uh, work with the team and stick around. And it's just a whole different era now. And now will that lead to success on the ice? We hope so. And it looks like this team has the most competitive roster they've had in, I don't know, maybe over a decade, at least at least up to the 2017 season when they made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. But the optimism is here. And Sens fans are, they still, I don't think anyone's really on the fire DJ, fire Dorian train anymore, but those guys have a short leash now, now that there's a new owner in that wants to put his stamp on things. Every week we have a guest on the show, a fan of the show. And last week's Avi, he, he said that I said, how long is the leash for the head coach? He says, we're holding his hand. Like there's no leash. Like you're holding hands and you can just let go at any, at any moment because the Sens mm-hmm. are going over to Sweden in November. They have a cupcake schedule. They play 14 out of their first 18 games at home before they go over at yeah. seas. And if they're not a well above 500 team, then, like you guys said, if all goes right, you're putting that on the T-shirt. Mm-hmm. We're putting no excuses on the T-shirt because mm-hmm. there really isn't. You've made the trades. You've used your draft picks. You spent signed the money. Contracts, like you yeah. spent the money. Like there's no excuses. This team, the best record they've had in their first 20 games is eight wins in the last five years. Like they mm-hmm. have 12 or better in their first 20. Like November has just sewered this team, and it, it really just can't happen again. And I think that, yeah, like like Kyle's kind of alluding to, from the outside looking in, you're like, wow, so patient, so patient. Mm-hmm. That patient is wearing thin, but right now it's being clout or like shadowed or, or covered with optimism, but it could quickly, like a couple blown leads late in games, or even if they just play dump and chase, everybody's sick of watching dump and chase hockey. I think fans are going to turn on this team pretty quickly, but right now, man, we got our heads in the clouds. It's all good, baby. Sends are winning the cup. Hey, now that, that, that that's okay. All, all quote unquote hate aside, you know, this debate, who's going to win the cup first, blah, blah, blah. I got, I got, like more questions about the makeup of your team, just based on okay. like how they were able to form uh, this sort of leadership group through again, the scrutiny and through bad hockey and through not making the playoffs. And that's kind of interesting. So you guys mentioned Brady Kachuk off the top. I, I have trouble saying Tim Su- Su- Sutsla's name. Just say it like this. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Tim? Tim superstar, superstar, Tim superstar, Jake Sanderson and company, they're signing long-term. And I saw that interview with uh, Tim superstar with Elliot Friedman. And that dude's just a gamer. You can tell, you can just tell he's a gamer. And he kind of reminds me of Pedersen, not going to lie the way, the way he talks and carries himself and using the word dominance. It's like, again, it's in the dictionary. It's been around for a long time, but that's a confident word to you. So when did you like, did you guys ever think that this was possible even through the losing and, when did you guys notice that, like, yo, Kachuk could rally the troops? Like, he's you that should, guy. You should have seen the hate online when they drafted Brady Kachuk. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's, it's hilarious going back to that tweet and reading the replies. It's hilarious. Mm-hmm. It's unreal. Yeah, he had eight goals his freshman year at Boston University. And everyone's yeah. like, this the, this the savior? We're at rock bottom. Now, the most interesting part of all that is they had traded that first-round pick in the Matt Duchesne trade, yeah. really the beginning of the end of any su- success. They traded for Matt Duchesne. Then they went over to Sweden, won both games against Matt Duchesne's Colorado Avalanche, and then they came back and lost 20 of their next 22 games. And it was just all pain since then. But from that moment, that was a top five protected pick or top 10, whatever it was. And the big debate was, do you give up this pick top fourth overall, knowing you're going to be even worse next year and have a chance to be the first overall pick? And Ottawa said, no, we know we got our guy here. They gave up what ended up being identical fourth overall pick, Bowen Byram, the next year. But you're like, okay, you get Brady Kachuk. That's a cornerstone piece. He plays with Mark Stone the first year, lives with him, learns Mm. from him, all that. And Um, it turned out to be the right decision. Obviously, then you get lucky. Like, they don't have a first-round pick in 2019, fourth overall. But then because of the Carlson trade and San Jose just plummeting, they end up getting third overall in 2020 and fifth overall. So that was probably the part. And now that I think about it in the Dorian trajectory, like right when it was about to hit rock bottom with them, it's like, wait, COVID and you get two top five picks in a deep draft that I feel like earned him a lot of extra mm-hmm. role that maybe did he deserve it or not. But I feel like that's where the story begins of the rebuild. Eh, pills. Yeah. I mean that those two picks were the make or break, whether this team was going to stop digging and get out mm-hmm. of the rebuild, or if they miss on those picks, you're still digging and you're, you're still trying to find rock bottom. So yeah. thank God they went with Timmy and Jake Sanderson over, 
you know, obviously Byfield wasn't there, but Byfield or some of those other guys that were in that area. And Mm -hmm. yeah, same with Sanderson. A lot of people thought that was a reach, but nobody thinks that anymore. Well, he's sick. You just have to watch him play. He's like very Mm -hmm. confused. You just see him on the highlights, right? Like, okay, why he's so good. But with Jake Sanderson, it's so like, it's more of like a little thing dominance where it's just kind of like, Maybe maybe he doesn't have three points at the end of the night, but you're like, okay, when he was on the ice, the team had like 20 more shots than they gave up. Mm-hmm. You're like, okay, he's dominant. But, yeah, they, they kind of swung and missed, it, it seems, at least right now in 2021 at 10th overall. But a lot of questions – like there was a, a legit top nine in that draft, and it sucked they were on the outside looking in there. Tyler Boucher just hasn't been able to stay healthy, but he plays that piss and vinegar game where if he can be healthy and play in the playoffs, you like kind of the makeup of the type of player. But – yeah, th- it's been a long winding road of the rebuild, and it just feels like now it's like you go to the Jersey store and you're like, okay, I know these guys are all going to be around. But the moment where I think really flipped everything is Claude Giroux coming here. And he, him, mm-hmm. with his respect around the league, putting his stamp of approval, being like, hey, I haven't won a cup yet. I want to do that in my career. I'm 34 years old, but I believe. And he said it in his introduction. He goes, I don't know when it's going to be, whether it's this year, next, he signed a three-year deal, but let's be honest, he's not moving his young family again, unless mm-hmm. it really goes wrong. He'll be a Senator for life. We hope like a Joe Pavelski type where he just continues to put up points. But when he put his stamp of approval on this, it really felt like things were going in the right direction. They had a 13 point improvement year over year into last. And now it's like, okay, there's one step, but it doesn't get any easier. It only gets harder. So I'm, I'm curious to see there's a cautious optimism around the team right now, but I have no clue how they're going to come out of the gate. Yeah. I think cautious optimism is really the sentiment in both of our markets. And, you know, I think before we wrap up here, I, I do want to know from you guys more about the sense in their playoff picture, but before I get into that, you, you guys talked a bit about Brady Kachuk and, and, you know, the hate that the senators got for drafting them fourth overall. Well, I think the funny thing about that is, is a draft that worked out pretty well for both teams because the Ottawa senators passed on a guy called Quinn Hughes who well, fell three spots later went seventh overall. So uh, maybe it's a twofold question here. Like we talk about the big three and I don't really want to throw goaltending into it um, just because I think, you know, that really slants it in the Canucks favor. Um, but kind of looking at Brady Kachuk versus Quinn Hughes uh, between the two, who, those two guys, who would you rather have? And then maybe going to the big three, I kind of had Pedersen, Miller, Hughes versus uh, Stutzla, Kachuk and Sanderson. Uh, maybe I'll let you guys answer that between uh, either of those two questions. Well, let's be clear. They didn't pass on Quinn Hughes because they got hey. Chuck. They got their captain, their dog. And I know Quinn's now the captain following yeah. his footsteps. He's got Brady on speed dial. How do I do this, Brady? <laughs> <laughs> He's so successful doing this, you know? Uh, no, but in all seriousness, I think we got to look at Arizona taking Barrett Hayton at fifth <laughs> overall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Detroit taking Philip Zadina when <laughs> Quinn Hughes went to school down the street. Well, Thank that- you very much. That's who passed on Quinn Hughes. The Sens got their guy from the uh, the Boston University Terriers there. But, man, you, the three guys you mentioned for Ottawa right there, they're 24, 21, and 20 years old right now. Or actually, Jake just turned 21 as well. And they're all top five picks, right? Timmy went third, Brady fourth, and Sanderson went fifth. So I think that for them, they're still kind of finding their way, right? Whereas Patterson, we, we know this guy's a superstar. And you look at it, and our friends at FanDuel, I checked it out right when you did that ad read right off the top, man. Plus 126 for Patterson to get 100 points. Like, I'm going to be all over that this year. I think he hits yeah. it. And for, for the Canucks listeners out there, fellas, Tim Stutzla had 39 goals last year as a 2021-year-old. 20, He's plus 450 to get 40 goals this year. Plus 450. I mean, they're just giving it away at FanDuel. <laughs> so I know I'm, it's a roundabout way. I got my guys just because we don't know what the ceiling is. I'd probably say that in order, mm. like, like JT Miller to me is like the X factor in all this where it's like, is he giving up as much the other way as he's scoring offensively? Like that's that's where it's like, is he going to be a hundred percent or is he going to be chirping my goalie half the game, telling him to get off the ice on a delayed penalty? Like that's where I, I, I don't know what I'm getting in the room with JT Miller. Whereas I know that all three of the guys in Ottawa have the same common goal and it's just to, to win. And they haven't achieved that yet, which is why I see a valid argument for the other side. Not that they've done much in the playoffs either, but um, I do think it's a very fun and interesting debate. And man, I'm a Quentin Hughes super fan too. Like if mm-hmm. I'm on the team, man, he's on it for sure. So uh, that's a roundabout way of saying I got my guys, but I can definitely see, you know, both sides uh, having a pretty solid argument here. Pills, are you going to be stronger than that? No, I mean, if you're looking at Brady versus Quinn Hughes, 
obviously classic bias. I, I'm going to take Brady, but only, only because I just think it's the intangibles that Brady brings that you can't find in any other player. Now, sure, Quinn Hughes has uh, skills that are very hard to find as well. He's the number one uh, defenseman on the team. He's one of the best offensive defensemen in the entire league. I'm definitely willing to give my props and sick taps to Quinn Hughes. But the thing is with Brady, like you've got a guy that scores 30-plus goals, plays hard, fights is a leader. He has that hockey pedigree, the Kachuk family. I mean, I'm talking about the Hughes Hughes family is obviously Mm -hmm. massive these days as well, but he's got his dad, Walt and Matthew Kachuk, like just some legendary hockey style families right here. And Mm -hmm. go ahead. Ross, what's up? I got got a fun stat for you that, uh, that I found on Twitter the other day. It's so funny. Most points from a player this season that had also 240 hits. Luke Shen had 22, Garnet Hathaway had 22, Nola Chari had 23, Jack McBain had 26. Oh, yeah, and then Brady Kachuk had 83. <laughs> like, Holy. they just take them. There's two players in the That's league the that had more than 80 points and more than 100 penalty minutes, uh, Matthew and Brady Kachuk. Like, they're just unicorns. Like, you just can't yeah. Yeah. guys like that. Yeah. And that's, why I think, the uniqueness. Like, there, there's 10 Tim Stutzlas. There's, you know, maybe five Elias Pettersons, but – he's just a unicorn out there. Yeah. It's crazy. And he's 6'4". He's 225. He'll fight anybody. He was 19 years old fighting Shea Weber. Like, what? Like he's almost, like, ignorant in how, mm-hmm. how he does his thing. He fights Blake Wheeler. He also fights bums, which he needs to stop doing. Like, <laughs> he doesn't need to be – who did he fight last? Jared Tenorti. Jared like, you Tenorti, can't be yeah. fighting. No disrespect to Jared Tenorti. I know he, his family listens to Locked on Canucks. They have <laughs> But he can't be fighting these guys anymore. Yeah. He's fighting John Marino. That's where he needs to clean it up. But otherwise, like he's just a unicorn out there. Pilsy, sorry to cut you off. I know you're you're on a roll there. No, I mean that that's basically what I was getting at is I just think that it's so hard to find someone with the combination of skills that Brady Kachuk has that uh, like there's not a lot of players I'm taking over Brady Kachuk, honestly. No, and you guys brought up the whole unicorn thing. And again, the Canucks don't win games. So it's kind of it's kind of a waste of time to be watching them at 10 p.m. But there's this uh, sentiment over here that Pedersen is a unicorn. And we, we still haven't seen the best of him yet because we're about to see... Like Trevor was looking at the stats, right? There hasn't been a lot of guys. I think there might be only one. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But he's, he's going to be like a 100-point guy who's going to win a Selkie. Like I see that in him. And yeah. that's a unicorn. Definitely. That's like offensively dominant and defensively dominant. That's... That's someone you need in the playoffs, you know? And then Quinn Hughes, there's a different level to his defensive game, and he's been getting better and better. And I think his competitive nature, you guys see it from Brady Kachuk too. These guys want to get better. And then Trevor Beggs, I'll let him take it from here. He sees a different level in his offensive game as well, which could also make him a unicorn also. It just, there's, there's like the top end talent on both these teams. It's globally unseen yet because of the lack of wins and attention that comes from not winning. It's just, not there, you know, but again, these teams just have those types of players. What that makes us makes us think, you know, if everything goes right, if everything goes, we're a team. <laughs> we are a team, man. Hey, any chance we could like take the best players from the Canucks, best players from the Senders, and just like be bully pretty good. Them? No, like, let's go for it, fellas. <laughs> the van, the Vanita Kennedors. There we go. There. Yeah, <laughs> let's that, do that it. Rolls off the tongue nicely. Wait a second. That was a shot there. Hey, eh? we were still playing out in Canada. We're going to take an hour to get there for the home opener. <laughs> start. I got to set my alarm at 630. To make yeah, sure. I, I, I drive by I drive by Canadian Tire Senator in beautiful Canada on my way to uh, Carlton Place, Ontario, every time I'm out there visiting you guys. So make sure you stop at the car dealership next door and then next door to that and next door to that. That's all there is out there. It's unreal. Yeah, I, oh, don't don't forget the uh, the Tanger, the Tanger outlets, man. Oh, yeah. Shout out to the Tanger outlets. Got to have you got to have it. A nice full wallet when you go in there. But hey, I think we got to make a pitch there to both our fan bases to be following along, man. Get the early game. Hey, if you're out in Vancouver, beautiful day. You get mm-hmm. home. Maybe the rain starts coming in and you go in four o'clock, get your sends fix, and then roll right in. I mean, the two captains are best friends. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. watching each other's games. So I think we need to make sure that we're sending everyone over at Locked On Canucks, Locked On Senators, and get this ship to the moon. Hey, they only play twice a year. So that's 80 other games. That you can be rocking for the uh, for the other one. Air support, we're, as you guys love to say, we're all Canucks. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful, man. That's mm-hmm. beautiful. And I will say, out here on the West Coast, there's a lot of hate for Toronto. I'm on board with that. A lot of hate for Montreal. Not so much on board with that, but I get it. 
And then Ottawa, I don't think there's much hate for Ottawa at all. So I think, you know, Canuck fans out here want that four o'clock game. Ottawa is a pretty exciting team to watch. You got Kachuk and Quinn Hughes, like best friends, man. Uh, I'm taking Quinn Hughes over Brady Kachuk, but uh, that's just me. You know, when you guys were talking about Brady Kachuk there, he did remind me of another old uh, Vancouver Canuck, and I think you know who I'm talking about, and Todd Bertuzzi. So I think this is a good segue, a good way to end off the show, uh, debating between West Coast Express versus the Pizza Line on the final segment here of the crossover episode of Locked On Canucks and Locked On Sens. But make sure you go subscribe to the Locked On Senators channel or the Locked On Canucks channel. You know, I mean, here at Locked On Canucks, kind of I've been doing this for about five months now. But uh, the Locked On Sends boys, Ross Brandon there, you guys are setting the standard here at Locked On, okay? so uh, Five years, yeah. first five months. Boy, this is year <laughs> five, fellas. The, ex- the experience shows, man. We'll see how much it shows on the other side here in the final segment of the crossover episode, baby. 